Amen. It's good to be saved, right? Amen. Good to be in church, right? Good to see me, right? I've been trying to train them. If you weren't here for Sunday school, we're trying to get these folks up to speed. Um, well, it is good to be here. It is good to be saved. Uh, I will mention maybe something about the book table tonight and maybe tomorrow night. I want to explain why we have it. We have it for only one reason. We are desperate. We just, you know, it's, it's either this or steel. And so uh, we figured we'd sell something. But anyway, my wife, Gipper, would you, Miss Gipper, would you stand up? It's my wife, Kathy. Uh, she would be back there to, uh, I said it this way, she's going to be back there to take your money. We have been married for 43 years. Trust me, I can testify. She knows how to take money. It is just a blessing to me to see her taking somebody else's, you know. Um, I'll tell you what I would ask you to do. If you would, uh, uh, if you don't get anything off the book table at all, <clears throat> if you would take a prayer card, we'd appreciate that. Uh, we've been on the road for 30 years. Um, I've been preaching for 45. The, um, we actually do two years east, two years west. Uh, uh, this is 15 uh, 14 and 15 were the east. We'll be crossing over uh, in February. We'll be over there for 16 and 17. Uh, and we, we do the whole country in a four-year uh, circuit. And we do that in four years because it takes me that long to get seven new messages. But um, uh, let me tell you a story. I broke my neck in 1973 just out of Bible college. Uh, my doctor overlooked it. And so uh, consequently, it was almost three months before they fixed it. It gives me a lot of trouble. Um, if you could uh, remember us in prayer, my wife. If you speak to her from behind and she does not respond, she does not hear well. She has uh, uh, hearing aids, and, and, it's, and her hearing is getting worse and worse, I know, because <clears throat> I'm throwing, have, have to throw bigger and bigger books at her to get her attention. But um, uh, the road is a hard thing on your body. She had a good back when we took off on the road 30 years ago. She doesn't now. And so if you would be willing to take a prayer card, we'd appreciate it. I'm not asking you to promise, you know, any particular time. We look at it like this, guys. If we get onto a Baptist refrigerator, we got like six opportunities a day of getting prayed for. And so um, uh, the prayer cards are back there. Uh, anything else, um, don't try to steal it. She carries, she'll drop you like a bad habit, okay? <laughs> You'll never make it to your car. But um, anyway, so uh, uh, she'll be back there to help you with anything, and I, I'll mention some of the things there. Uh, we have three sons. I told, you, I told the Sunday school class, our oldest is 39, our middle one is 35, and our youngest is 30. Uh, one lives in Pensacola, Florida, one lives in Denver, uh, Colorado, the other lives in Lewiston, Idaho. The two out west are 800 miles apart. We don't see them very often. They like that for some reason. But um, you, you grandmothers can understand what it's like to have your grandchildren spread out all over the country and never see them. So that might help you pray for my wife, too. She's a good lady. She's a good lady. Um, I told her she must have been wicked in a former life to have to marry me in this one. But... but um, uh, after, after these two days, I'll guarantee you will be praying more for my wife. You want to get that prayer card. Um, open your Bibles to um, Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24. And I'm going to tell you what's wrong with you, preacher. And you say, preacher, we ain't got that kind of time. I know, I know. But you know, preachers get blamed for a lot. They really do. You know, we get, uh, you know, preachers are this and preachers are that and preachers are this. And, you know, I'm an evangelist. You know, I, I'll pull that motorhome <clears throat> and... Uh, uh, we'll be refueling, and somebody will walk up and they'll, say, they'll ask me this question. They'll say, now, uh, are you just going on vacation or just coming back? And I know when I answer the question, they're going to break fellowship with me, okay? And I tell them, no, I'm an evangelist. I said, we just live in this all year long. And when, as soon as I tell them I'm an evangelist, they put one hand on their wallet and the other one around their wife. We get blamed for everything. Is that not true? But I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you the one charge that is brought against preachers more than any single charge. And it's true. We are unreasonable. Pre preachers are unreasonable. I mean, you know, you're never in church enough. You're never reading your Bible enough. You're never tithing enough. You're never passing enough tracts. You're never doing enough. You're never... I mean, it's like... And, and when, when people hear preachers being unreasonable, uh, here's how you look at it. You kind, of, you kind of say it like this. You know, preacher, we're over here, and you want us to come clear over here. If you would just be reasonable, if you just come over here, we'd meet you halfway. Guys, this morning, and only this morning, I'm going to be reasonable. This is out of character with me, okay? But I'm going to be reasonable. You come back tonight, I'll be my usual unreasonable self. <clears throat> but reasonable is just this. I was talking again in the Sunday school about the building being on fire. Baptists like to eat. You know what Baptists like to do? Vote. 
They all think they got to have their opinion heard. You know, I, I came into a church one time, and this lady came up. She was disgusted with her church. And uh, she said, you know what they did here? And I thought, well, I'm about to find out, I'm sure. And, uh, and she said, they painted the bathrooms, and nobody asked me what color I thought they should be. I mean, I, I know it's got to say something about that in the Bible. I'm sure it does. Anyway, and I told her, I said, well, maybe they didn't care. Well, it's really not the answer, but... Um, <laughs> But you know, everybody thinks, you know, well, I've got to be heard from. Look, if this building is on fire right now, I don't think you're going to hold a vote on what you should do next. It is only reasonable to get out of a burning building. Correct? And so I'm going to talk to you about some things that should just be reasonable. I mean, just makes good sense, okay? And, um, and so uh, I'm going to, uh, we start here in Acts chapter 24. <clears throat> Acts chapter 24. Uh, uh, Paul is standing before Felix, and it says this in verse 24. And after certain days, uh, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla. Now, those are two wonderful Bible names not to give you children. Okay? Don't say, here's my son, Felix, and my wife, Drusilla, uh, which was a Jewess. Uh, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, go thy way. Uh, for this time, when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. And he hoped, he hoped for, uh, uh, also that some money should be given him uh, of Paul, that he might lose him, wherefore uh, he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you now, God, for your goodness and your grace. Lord God, as we come to you this morning, we have no problem with you because there is nothing wrong with you. We have no problem with your book because there's nothing wrong with your book. But Lord God, you know every one of us as well as we know ourselves. And every one of us knows that we are a mess. In our own way, God, we are a mess. You didn't get any deal, God. You made no bargain when you got us. Now, Lord, this service is for you. These people are here to get something that will help them, Father, uh, edify them, that then, uh, being edified, they would leave here and live to your glory. And that is our desire this morning. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, here the Bible says that Paul reasoned with Felix about his salvation, guys. Guys, you know it's only reasonable to get saved. Do you know that? Getting saved is the most reasonable thing you can do. Uh, I Believe it or not, I don't like to start arguments. You know, I believe the King James Bible, uh, and, um, and, and I don't know, I don't know if I have ever started an argument about the King James Bible. Now, I have ended a bunch of them, all right? People come up and they think they're going to, you know, do something, and it, and it does not go the way they thought it was going to be. But, uh, but I just, I really don't like to argue. Uh, a lot of times people will ask you something because they want to they wanna let you know that uh, you're wrong. And, uh, and I, don't, I don't like, I got a friend. I like him. I really do. He loves to argue. He lives to argue. If, if he agrees with you on a subject, he will take the opposite side just to argue. And I see, I think that's unreasonable. He told me this. He said, my whole family's like this. He said, we all love to argue. He said, when we get together as a family, he said, we get together just to argue. I, mean, I don't know what that, that, that family reunion must be like. It must be like a night fight in Harlem or something, you know. But guys, I, I think you ought to be reasonable. Hey, guys, getting saved is the most reasonable thing you ever did. If you're not saved, you're the most unreasonable individual in this building. You know why? I'll tell you why. Because I know something about, I know two things. I know two things about every person on this planet. You know what they are? Everybody wants to live forever in a nice place. Now, you know that's true. There's just not very many people that want to walk up and smack Mike Tyson in the mouth and say, I bet I, a bitch can't whip me. Okay, you say, why? Because I'm going to live forever. I, I doubt anybody here is going to put a bag over their head at midnight and try to get across the freeway. Hey, let's see if we can do this. You say, no, I'm not going to do that. Why? Because everybody wants to live forever. Isn't that true? But everybody wants to live forever in a nice place. Now, guys... Um, I am a Buckeye, okay? You know what that is. It's a worthless nut. But, um, but I'm a Buckeye. We're from Massillon, Ohio, and I love my state, but they put it a little too close to Kentucky. Now, if you're from Kentucky, don't get upset. You won't understand anything about say anyway. But, um, but what's, let's just say this. Let's say you're out to buy a house. And you got this realtor. He's looking for a house for you, and you told him what you want, how much you want to pay. He calls you up one day and says, I got the house for you. This is, this is exactly what you've described to me, and the price is great. And so uh, you go to the house, and, 
And as you're pulling in, here's the house. You're about to pull in the driveway. You look across the street. Grass hadn't been mowed in a month, and there's five cars up on concrete block. And you go, oh, look, the uh, neighbors must be from Kentucky. And then you pull in, and, and as you pull in, all of a sudden, from, from about three blocks away, you don't hear it. You so much as feel it. And this car comes, pulls in a driveway next to you. Kid gets out, you know, he's got those baggy pants. They take two steps for he takes one. He's showing you this much of his underwear. He's got his baseball hat on sideways. Walks into the house, and you go, oh, look at that. The pizza delivery boy forgot his pizza. They go, oh, that's not the pizza delivery boy. That's a neighbor kid. Great kid. Has a party every Friday and Saturday night. Well, you go look at the house, man. It's the house you want. It's a beautiful house. Price is great. As you walk out from the house on the other side, all of a sudden you hear the sound of breaking glass. Somebody yells, I'm going to kill you. And this lady comes running out of there as fast as she can. And you go, man, you better call 911. He's going to kill her. He said, no, he's not going to kill her. Hadn't done it yet. Says it all the time. Guys, that might be the house you want. And that might be a great price. You're not going to buy it. You know why? Because everybody wants to live forever. Where? In a nice place. You know that when you trust Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, you're going to live forever. You know where it's going to be? Heaven. If God plays his music loud, trust me, you'll like it. He lives in the neighborhood. It'll all be okay. Guys, the most reasonable thing you can do is trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And if you are one of those people, you just like to argue, you like to complain, whatever the case may be. Uh, you say, well, this is my, you know, this is how I am. That's all right. But if you got saved, that's the most reasonable thing you ever did. Nobody should go to hell being stubborn, all right? And so it is reasonable to get saved. I want you to go to Isaiah chapter 1. The book of Isaiah chapter 1. And verse 18 says this, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You know, we sing, a, we sing a song. I'm not out for changing any of our hymns. We sing a song where it says, uh, sin was as black as can be. You know sin's not black. Sin is red. Sin is as red as that flower right there. That's what the Bible says. Sin is red. Guys, you know, uh, here's how, there's only two colors of people on this planet. You say, oh, no, there's, no, no. You know what colors they are? Red from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. Those are the people who have not trusted Christ, their personal Savior, and white from the top of their feet. Those are the folks who have trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. When God looks down here, He doesn't look at skin color. He doesn't care about your background. He doesn't care about where, where you came from. He sees only red folks and white folks, okay? Now, years ago, I used to paint cars. I like cars. And I used to paint cars. You know what I learned? You cannot paint a red car white. You can't paint a red car white. Tell you what you do. You sand that red car down and you mask it off, and you spray that red paint on there, red is known as a bleeder. And what happens is that, that you get that red car, you paint that white, you, you shoot that white over top of it, the red that's already on that car will bleed into that car. Look, guys, I'm going to tell you something. Tomorrow morning, you're going to be selling Mary Kay Cosmetics. That car is going to be pink. You say, well, I'll just spray it white again. It'll be a lighter shade of pink. Well, I'll spray Look, you can paint it till the, the paint is as thick as this pulpit, it's going to be pink. You know why? Because you can't paint a red car white. But you can paint a red car white. You know what you do? You sand that car down. You mask it off. Now, here's what you can't allow. You cannot allow that white to touch that red. Because if that touches that red, that red's going into that white. So before you put that white on there, you spray a sealer. And then when you put that white on, that white never touches that red. You know what the Bible says about us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30? For whereby you are, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Guys, here's what happens. You were red. You and I, I don't care what your sins were, from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, you were as red as that flower. You were, your sins were scarlet. And when you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you might have got down on your knees red. You got off your knees white from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. If we saw people like God saw people, we'd all know who's saved, who's not. Now let me ask you a question. First off, if you're white from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, you will never again be red from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. But here's my question. You ever eat spaghetti? I take this back. You ever wear spaghetti? 
What would you do, guys, you know, uh, if this morning I came in here, and right here, right there, you saw a red spot. Now, you don't know. Let's say uh, I had some strawberry jelly on my toast this morning, and I did the impossible. I missed this mouth. And I got a red spot there. Now, you don't know if it's ketchup. You don't know if it's blood. You don't know if it's uh, jelly. You don't know if it's uh, tomato sauce. You know what you'd all say? You'd all go home tonight and say, did you see that preacher? He came to church with a dirty shirt. You know what I'd say? If you came up and said I'd had a dirty shirt, I'd say, now, wait a second. Look here. Collar's white. Cuffs are white. Sleeves are white. Pocket's white. This panel's white. The back is white. It's mostly white, isn't it? But everybody notices what? Everybody notices a spot. Guys, you know it's only reasonable. To have, you ought to be reasonable in your sanctification and getting those spots taken care of after you've gotten saved. You know what you people do? You will allow some little sin in your life, and you allow it, and you know what you base it on? It's just a spot. Yeah, guys, but everybody sees a spot. Everybody notices a spot. Now, <clears throat> I don't do laundry, okay? I did laundry, I did laundry for two years when I was in Bible college when I was single. Now, when I was in Bible college, uh, I'd go down to the laundromat, a washer was 10 cents, no, a washer was 20 cents, and a dryer was 10 cents. And I did my whole laundry for 30 cents. Now, when I say that, all the women go, they cringe, and all the men go, yeah, makes sense. Which is, I think, how, that's life as it ought to be, all right? And as soon as I get done, there's always some poor woman, I'm sorry, ma'am, you, you just don't get it, okay? A uh, woman comes up and she goes, how did you do that? I said, well, I put it on a machine. The colors. And the white? Oh, I said, my laundry was Martin Luther King approved. It was totally integrated. Man, I said, I'd put it in there. I'd tamp it down. And then you know what I put in? I put in some soap. You say, you didn't measure? You know what I measured? I measured how far the suds got from the machine when it was running. They got this little thing here, it's kind of magic, and it pumps the suds out, and if it made it across the top of the machine, down the front, and all the way over to the bank of dryers, I knew my clothes would be clean that week. I might, I might be a little chafed, but I knew my clothes were going to be clean. And then after I got done washing them, I'd take them all out of that washer, I'd put them in a dryer, I'd put in a dime, and I'd set it on nuclear. You couldn't touch my clothes for three days. I used to take my laundry out of the dryer with tongs. But guys, there were no germs on my clothes. You say, oh, he had killed them. No, no self-respecting germ would be seen on my clothes. I said that. Some, some woman didn't get it. She came up and she said, my, you must have had a lot of ironing to do. I said, ma'am, there's no iron in my house. You guys may not know this. You actually have somebody famous preaching for you. I am the inventor of wash and wear. And if it ain't wash and wear when I get it, when I get it, it becomes wash and wear. All right? I just don't do any ironing. I don't do any, I, I don't do laundry. Uh, some years ago, uh, you know, we've been on the road, I say, for, for uh, 30 years. And some years ago, uh, my mother-in-law was sick, and I left my wife in Ohio uh, to, to, to nurse her back to health, and I went to a meeting. I don't know why I did that. Anyway, uh, uh, they, put me up in this, uh, they put me up in this missionary apartment, and they had a brand new washer and a brand new dryer, and I thought, Gip, you can take a gun apart and put it together. You can do laundry. And I went down there, and I, I, I know not to put the colors in whites. I don't even know why. I just, it really upsets women. I could have done my laundry, but they sabotaged the washing machine. They put two knobs on it. One of them said, hot, 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 cool, cool, cold, warm, cool. I said, my goodness, we're talking about a Christian. The other time, 10, 4, we're talking about a Christian while we're drinking Dr. Pepper. I took everything out. I gave it to the preacher. I said, have somebody do this laundry. I don't do laundry, all right? My wife does laundry. And, and you know what happens? Now, now you, know, you know, ladies, you know all that stuff you've got to go to to do the laundry. But sometimes, you know, I get something on my sleeve. And she'll say, come here. And we go over to the sink, and she gets her washcloth, puts some soap on it, and it's gone. It didn't have to go to the washer, didn't have to go through the dryer, didn't have to be ironed. Always hurts when she irons them. You know why? 
Because it's easy to take care of a spot, isn't it? It's only reasonable to take care of a spot. Nobody wants to walk around with a spot. Guys, if you've got a spot on you, a red spot on you, you've been saved, you, you are white from the top of your head, the bottom of your feet, and you allow a little sin in your life, you have a little red spot, guys, you don't need to be resaved. You just need to be rewashed. And you're unreasonable if you don't let the Lord take that one spot off of you. And so uh, you need to be reasonable in your salvation. You need to be reasonable in your sanctification. Look at uh, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Now, I um, appreciate the language of the King James Bible. I appreciate the language of God. And Paul says this in verse 1. He said, uh, I inform you. Oh, he says, uh, I urge you. I suggest, strongly suggest. He says, I beseech, right? You know what beseech is? That is not like saying, hey, you ought to do this. It would be good if you did this. Boy, it would be nice if you did this. Don't you be handy if you did this? No, no, no. You know what beseech is? Beseech is where you grab a hold of somebody by the, by the shirt and say, listen, listen. You've got to listen to me. You need to do this. This is what the Apostle Paul's doing. When you read, when you read Romans chapter 12, verse 1, you ought to feel the Apostle Paul grab a hold of you and, I mean, stare you right in the face and say, I beseech you, therefore. He is trying to get a point across. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Guys, you know it's only reasonable to serve the God that died for you. I was raised Roman Catholic. Uh, I stole my first car when I was 14 years old. I got arrested my first time when I was 14 years old. I spent my first night in jail when I was 14 years old. By the time I got saved, I was, uh, at, the, at the time I got saved, uh, me and a friend of mine were planning on breaking this guy's house. We were going to wait till he wasn't home, steal some stuff that he had. Uh, and I knew we'd end up getting caught. Not that night, you know, but we'd get caught someplace down the road. Uh, and my friend said, well, what do we do if he comes home and catches us? I said, we'll kill him. I did not care. That's where my life was. All right? And, and I knew I was going to hell. There was no Bible in our home. Uh, I'd never seen a gospel track. I'd never been inside anything but a Roman Catholic Church. I didn't know. Uh, I knew Jesus Christ was the Son of God. I sang all the songs we sang this morning. But his death, burial, and resurrection were never personal to me. I never, I never trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Guys, on June 14, 1970, when I was 20 years old, up in the Canton Baptist Temple in Canton, Ohio, I came forward when they get in a service like this one. I got down on my knees at the altar, and I trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Oh, man. I'm telling you, I was thrilled. I gave my new life to the Lord Jesus Christ right then and there. Ten weeks later, I was in Bible college. You know why? Because I think it's only reasonable to serve the God that saved you. I don't understand people, you know, you go out there and you serve the world or you serve the devil or you serve yourself, whoever it is, but you serve them and then you get saved. You make a mess of your life. People make a mess of their lives. They work hard. Some people work hard. I mean, they work hard to turn their life into a train wreck, never realizing how successful they will be. Then they trust Jesus Christ, their personal Savior. He not only saves them, but he does what? He gives them a brand new life, right? And then they go back to the same master that they had before that ruined their first life. And they say, look, i got a new life. Here, I'll give this one to you too. You're a fool. It is only reasonable to serve the God that died for you. You know that nobody loves you like you love yourself or, or like the Lord loves you? Nobody loves you like the Lord loves you. I tell people this. There are, there are two kinds of sin in the world, not mortal and venial. You know what they are? The sins you brag about and the sins you're ashamed of. When I was lost, we'd sit in a bar. Man, we'd brag about our sin. I bet there's some people here, you bragged about your sin one time or another, didn't you? Sure you did. Get this. All the time we're sitting in that bar bragging about our sins, I, and when I'm bragging about my sin, I knew stuff about myself I didn't want anybody there to find out about. Guys, here's what I'm telling you. If the person sitting beside you right now knew about you what you know about yourself, they'd move over. And it's not because they're better than you. They just kind of feel better about it. Okay? Guys, you, have, you know so many things about yourself that when you really realize how wicked you are and how sinful you are, it's hard to even love yourself, isn't it? Jesus Christ knew everything you know about yourself and went to the cross 
anyway. Guys, there is no better description of love. It is not that he loved you because you kept hidden the truth. He went to the cross knowing what you are, knowing every one of your secret sins, knowing everything that you are ashamed of. Do you understand? And he went to the cross anyway. And then you trusted his death and his burial and his resurrection as a sole and complete payment for your sin. And then you said, I am not going to serve him. That just doesn't make any sense to me. Guys, I feel, I feel totally lifetime indebted to this God. He saved me, guys. He set my feet upon a rock. He pulled me out of the miry clay. Uh, he changed my life. He gave me a new future. Do you understand? Guys, it is only reasonable to serve the God that saved you. And yet, you know what most people do? I'm going to tell you what Jesus Christ is to most Christians. I call him the divine fire escape. He got you out of the burning building. He saved you from a fate of an eternity in hell. And beyond that, you don't care another thing about him. You got out of the building. You never looked back. You went back to the, to the life you had before. It, you might not be living for the devil. And you might not be, uh, you know, neck deep or eye deep in the world. But you're living for yourself. And you got no intention of living for this God that paid for your sins. Guys, it is only reasonable to serve the God that saved you. It's only reasonable to care about him enough to want your life to count for him. I am so blessed. I thought all I could do was be saved and go to heaven. When I found out I got a chance to serve him, I was thrilled. Guys, you need to be reasonable in your salvation. You need to be reasonable in your sanctification. You need to be reasonable in your service. I want you to go to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, you find out that the Apostle Paul was a three-point preacher. He had a three-point sermon and Praise the Lord, he had no poem. Look what it says. Acts chapter 17, verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of scriptures. Now, out of the scriptures. Now watch this three-point message. Opening and alleging that Christ, point one, must needs have suffered. Point two, and risen again from the dead. Point three, that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. He had a three-point message. You know why? Because those Jews didn't think Christ was supposed to suffer. They thought he was going to come in here, ride on a white horse, beat down the Romans, set up the kingdom, and, and they didn't know he was supposed to suffer. They didn't know he was supposed to die. Paul had to explain that. Don't worry, because when they kill him, what do you guys say? You say, you can't keep a good man down. And he is the best there was. And three days and three nights later, he stepped out of, out of an empty tomb and said, I'm back. <laughs> so Christ must needs have suffered and rose again from the dead, and that this man, Jesus, whom they murdered, was Christ the Lord. Now, it says he reasoned with them out of the Scripture. You know what I'm guessing? I'm guessing he didn't use the book of Romans. I'm guessing he didn't use First and Second Corinthians. I, I don't imagine he used Hebrews. He probably didn't use James or First Peter, Second Peter. What do you reckon? You reckon he might have gone to the Old Testament. Well, wait a minute. How could he do that if he hadn't studied it? Guys, I think you should be reasonable in your study of this book. I am a student of this book. I think we should be students of this book. There, look, look. I told you I like cars, and I do. I. Uh, I could probably tell you uh, every uh, cubic inch of every V8 that Chevy ever offered. Give me some time. All right? I'm talking about the ones that came under the hood, not the crate motors, 502s, and, uh, and such. But um, uh, I, I could probably tell you the, the, uh, the cubic inch of every Chevy V8 ever built. But that's okay. But I better know some Bible, too. You know, I, I was talking to one of the guys before church about, uh, about the Buckeyes this year, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a Buckeyes fan, all right? <clears throat> I'm, I'm hoping one of these days that Cleveland gets a pro football team. But, um, but here's the thing, guys. When the Buckeyes win, I am excited for about five minutes. And when they lose, I am upset for about five minutes. You say, well, why only five minutes? Because after that, I forget about it because it's just a game. You know, you mention some football player and somebody will say, oh yeah, he went to this college. Here's his stats when he was in college. Uh, when he came, he, he was the first round draft pick. Uh, here were his stats. Uh, well, you know, he was, he was the rookie of the year. Uh, he was player of the year. He's been all pro every year. Look, I don't mind if you know that stuff. But you ought to know some Bible too. I imagine somebody, you could tell me all about hunting and fishing. That's okay. But you know any Bible too? 
Who exempted you from knowing the book? Guys, I think that we should be students of this book. When I was, when I was in Bible college, I was a painter painting houses. And I remember we're, I'm, in, I'm in this brand new house, uh, and we're just finishing it up, and I'm in the den, and I'm doing the, uh, the baseboards and, and the, the uh, door frames and window frames and stuff. And the only guy, other guy in the, in the building was in the room with me. He was an electrician. He's up on a ladder, and he's putting up a ceiling fan in that den. And so I said this. I said, um, I said, hey, can I ask you a question? He said, sure. I said, if you died right now, do you know for a fact you go to heaven? He said, I sure do. I said, are you saved? He said, I sure am. I said, well, praise the Lord. I am glad. He said, let me ask you a question. I said, okay. He said, if you died right now, do you know for a fact you'd go to heaven? Well, guys, I am not bothered by somebody asking me that question. But um, I, I question, somebody asked me that question after I asked him that question. What did he think my response was going to be? No, I'm going to hell. Just want to see who's going to be there with me. I mean, what answer did he expect? And he said, do you know for a fact if you die right now, you go to heaven? I said, I sure do. He said, are you saved? I said, I sure am. He said, now wait a minute. He said, by saved. I mean, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, had the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and had the initial evidence of speaking in tongues? Because if you haven't spoken in tongues, you're not saved. I said, no kidding. He said, no kidding. I said, let me ask you another question. I said, you don't have to quote these word for word. You don't even have to nail every book, chapter, and verse for them. But I said, could you just give me five references in the Bible that say, in essence, maybe not even word this, these exact words, but say, in essence, quote, unquote, ye must speak in tongues to be saved. He said, I can't. I said, why not? He said, there's not five verses in the Bible to say that. I said, no problem. Can you give me one? He said, I can't. I said, why not? He said, there's not one. I said, man, is your God stupid? I, he like to fell off his ladder. He said, why? I said, your God is stupid. He said, why would you say that? I said, well, to get to heaven, <clears throat> you've got to trust Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, and have the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the initial of speaking in tongues, right? He said, right. I said, okay, you know that, and now that you told me I know that, and I said, your God couldn't say it one time clearly in the Bible. I said, that's a pretty stupid God. And then you know what I did? I quoted five verses that showed salvation was by grace. Well, wait, let me ask you a question. You can't show somebody five verses that salvation is by grace? If not, why not? Why is it that you can, you can talk all day? Go, well, I just don't talk about politics and religion. I was working a job one time. Started witnessing some guys at lunch. And this guy goes, wait a minute. He said, I don't talk about, I don't talk about politics, and I don't talk about religion. I don't let anybody talk about him in my presence. Okay, it's good enough for me. And five minutes later, he's talking politics. So I started witnessing to him. He said, hey, I told you I don't talk about politics and religion. I said, yeah. And I said, they start talking about politics. And I said, I figure you lied about the first one. You lied about the second one too. So I started talking about religion. You know why you don't want to talk about religion? You know why you, you don't want to talk about the Bible? Not only because you don't know anything about it, you're not interested in knowing anything about it. You know why? Because you're not reasonable. You ever lead anybody to Christ? Have you been saved? Because if you've been saved... Couldn't you get saved looking at what? Five, ten, maybe, maybe a dozen verses in the Bible, and you can end up saved? When I lead somebody to Christ, you know what I like to do? We'll show them this and show them that, show them this and show them that. When they get done, I'll say, now look, I've showed you about 10, 15 verses in the Bible. And I said, you went from headed for hell to headed for heaven. I said, that's pretty good on 15 verses, right? Yeah, I said, so what do you reckon God's got in the rest of this book for you? God, shame on you. Shame on you. I, I don't care what you know. I'm not telling you you should know something. But, man, you're going to waste a lot of time. You're going to waste a lot of effort. You're going to waste a lot of space in this brain. Learn a bunch of facts that are going to mean a stinking thing. You understand that? And then you're not a student of this book. You ought to be a student of this Bible. You ought to be reasonable in your study of this book. Let me show you something. Uh, look at, get, get two places in your Bible. Get Luke chapter 1. And get Leviticus chapter 27. For some of you will be home eating when you finally find Leviticus 27.
Luke chapter 1, Leviticus chapter 27. Now, those people that don't like the idea that God gave us a perfect Bible, they love to find something they think is a mistake in a King James Bible. And then I heard a guy say it this way. He said, you put a man that's never been on a horse, you put a beggar on horseback, he'll ride off at a gallop. Because he's just so glad to be on a horse, he thinks he's a cowboy. And, and you get somebody that hates that book, and if they think they found a mistake in it, they will talk about it and talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. And look at this. This very thing that we're singing about, this very thing that this month is about, Here's this angel shows up and says this, um, uh, he says this in verse 34, Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I, I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. You see those two words, holy thing? Oh, oh man, holy thing? Oh, you get those guys that hate the King James Bible, they'll go like this. Holy thing? Holy thing, you King James Bible people, you use a Bible that calls the blessed Son of God a thing. I thought a thing was something that crawled out of the swamp and killed people in a movie. But you called our Savior a, your Bible calls our Savior a thing. Now you are going, oh man, yeah, maybe we better say Holy One. Maybe we better find out what Holy Thing is. Well, where would you find that out? Well, you might find it out in the Bible. Go back to Leviticus chapter 27. As you turn there, let me ask you a question. According to the Bible, what are you made out of? You made it, yeah, you made you're just made out of dirt, right? Listen, all of us just so much, so much walk and talk and dirt balls, some stack tires, some stack wider, but we're just so much dirt. Isn't that right? All right, so you're a piece of dirt. And being a Gentile, if you were if you were now maybe there's somebody that was Jewish in your in your lineage, but if you're a Gentile, you were this possession. And when you got saved, you were bought with a price, were you not? And he wants us to be sanctified, correct? Okay, here's my question. How do you sanctify a piece of dirt that you bought that was not of your possession, and you bought it? You don't even have to figure it out. Just read your Bible. Look what it says in Leviticus chapter 27. You're in Leviticus chapter 27. Look what it says in verse 21. Or verse 22. And if a man sanctify, there it is, unto the Lord a field, in the field piece of dirt, which he hath bought, which is not of the fields of his possession. Well, there it is. How do you do it? Then the priest shall reckon unto him the worth of thy estimation, even the, uh, unto the year of the Jubilee, and he shall give thine estimation in that day as a holy thing unto the Lord. You know what John said? John said, Behold the Lamb of God that take away the sin of the world. you know why? Because the Lamb of God was required to take away the sin of the world. But the Lamb of God doesn't take care of sanctifying a piece of dirt that wasn't of his possession that was bought. You say, what does that require? That requires a holy thing. Jesus was the Lamb of God. He was also the holy thing. And if you go scratching things out of your Bible, you're going to miss that cross reference. Guys, you ought to study this book. And then one last one. I want you to look at 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. Now guys, some scripture applies to us here and now, and some scripture applies to us in eternity, correct? All right, so you don't think I'm taking this out of context. You judge, you judge if this is talking about eternity or our life here and now. Look at verse 8. Finally, brethren, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrawise blessing, knowing that ye should that ye are called, an, uh, ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. If he will, uh, for he that will love life and see good days. Is that talking about eternity or here now? Isn't that talking about here and now? Okay. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil. I don't think you're going to have a problem with that in eternity. And his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Now, verse 13 is not the one I want to draw your attention to, but there's something wonderful about verse 13. Let's look at it. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? You know what's great about that verse? 
except for one word, followers. That's all single syllables. You say, preacher, I'm not good at memorizing scripture. I'm not good at memorizing scripture. I don't, I don't have a good memory for scripture. I'm still working on Jesus Christ. But guys, you can get that one in a day. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? Now, before I, I, I got to read a couple more verses, but, but let, me, let me preface it with this. There's a couple scripture that we classically misinterpret. I'm not against you misinterpret or, or, or misuse, misuse. And I'm not against you misusing something if you at least understand how it should be used. Example, uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Behold, I, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock, and any man hear me, I hear my voice, and open unto me, I will come and sup with him, and he with me. All right? That is a great verse to use for soul winning. And I've heard more than one person say, they're trying to win somebody to Christ, you know, the Lord is knocking on your heart's door, and if you'll open your heart's door, he'll come in and save you. That is a great verse for that, is it not? I've used it. Guys, that's not the context. The context is Revelation chapter 3, the lay of the sea in church. That's not Jesus knocking on the door of a, heart, a lost man trying to get him saved. That's him knocking on yours while you're watching your favorite reality TV program and don't have time to not answer the door. He's looking for fellowship with his people. I don't, look, look, if you and I were talking to somebody, you're trying to lead him to Christ, and you say, behold, the Lord is knocking on your door right now. He's, I'm not going to go, hey, stop it, that's bad doctrine. I don't mind if you misuse it. As long as you understand how it's supposed to be used. There's another verse here that we classically misuse. Look at verse 14. But if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Now here's the verse. Look at verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You know that we classically say you should be ready to give an answer to somebody why you have a hope of eternal salvation. But the context isn't eternal salvation. The context is here now, isn't it? Now, I, uh, I think the Lord's coming back. I don't think we're going through any part of the tribulation. Some of my brethren want to go through the tribulation. To be very honest, I would like some of my brethren to go through the tribulation. Okay? You can go through as much of it as you want to. I have a mother-in-law. That's as close to tribulation as I want to get here, okay? But, but guys, there is, there is ample scripture for the problem or, or, or our eternity. This is here and now. Isn't there always some kind of a threat? Man, I heard clear back in 1970. The guy said, you know, they have, uh, they have concentration camps for us in Alaska. Oh, my goodness. I heard about them in 1970. By now, I bet you could just knock the walls down by hitting them. That's pretty old. I preach in the Arctic. And every now and then, you know what I say? I'm going up to see the concentration camps that we have for the liberals. <coughs> you say, well, oh, just have some fun. Just have some fun. Guys, are we not afraid of everything? I know this. I, this is about 15 years ago, 16 years ago. The greatest terrorist attack on this country happened. You say, You're, the Twin Towers? No, no, no. Oh, no. This one started in 1973, 1993. This ta attack started in 1993, went steady every day, 24 hours a day for seven years. It was called Y2K. Oh, man, January 1st, 2000, the computers were all going to crash. The lights were going to go out. The water was going to shut off. The Russians were going to fire their missiles. Uh, the, the, uh, there were going to be food riots. Your mother-in-law was going to move in. I mean, every horrible thing that could possibly happen is going to happen on January 1st, 2000. And I'd come into churches, and I'd, I'd have these guys go, go, you ready for my 2K? I mean, they had a cabin up in the woods. They had, uh, you know, 30,000 rounds of ammunition, three years' supply of food. They're ready for the big one. And, and some of you guys, <laughs> I know none of you fell for it. No. But I'll, I'll guarantee you, somebody here is probably still eating freeze-dried pizza. You know what the problem with that was? I didn't, I didn't prepare you say, why? I didn't believe in it. You know why? Because I'm supposed to have some security here and now that the Lord is going to take care of me. And here's my problem with Y2K, guys. Here's my problem. One Sunday night, some lost guy watched a special on television. Look, can I give you a thought? Because if, you, if you're Americans, Americans quit thinking that they have to get their TV sets. You don't use your brain anymore. Now you just use your remote. In fact, if this will help you tonight, when you come back, bring your remote. 
Just hold it in your hand. Maybe something will get through, okay? I, I will forewarn you, mute won't work. But um, now, now think about this. If the goal of a terrorist organization is to instill fear and terror, then the greatest, most successful terrorist organization in the world is not ISIS, it's not Al-Qaeda, it's not the Taliban, it's, your, it's the evening news. They have scared you with more stuff. I mean, you have been, you have been scared to death about everything, have you not? Everything from Y2K to radon gas to flesh-eating bacteria to swine flu, isn't that right? It's a terrorist organization. And some lost guy during that, during that seven-year period, he watched this special about everything bad is going to happen. And he went to work the next day working with a save guy. He went, oh, man, everything's going to happen. What do you think we should do? And the, and the save guy said, well, I'll tell you where we can buy some freeze-dried food. And I got 30,000 rounds of ammunition. And I'm going to shoot anybody who comes looking for my food. Let me ask you a question. Where is that reaction any different than the lost world? Wouldn't it be something if we said, uh, well, I'll tell you what you do. Trust Jesus Christ, your personal Savior. Then trust him in your life to take care of you. You say, preacher, what would you have done if Y2K was as bad as they said it was? I would have got caught trusting Jesus Christ for my security here on this earth. I, I believe you ought to have a gun. I believe you ought to have a gun that nobody knows about, including your best friend so they can't turn it in for you. Not because you're going to overthrow any government guys for two reasons. One of these days you may have to get food and keep food. But the day you trust that gun, you're an idiot. The day you trust what you got, you're crazy. All right? You know what you ought to trust? You ought to trust the Lord for your security here and now on earth. Don't you think it would have been a blessing to God if during Y2K all the Christians would have said, well, maybe that's all true, but we're just going to trust the Lord. You ought, to have, you ought to be reasonable in your security here and now. You should be reasonable in your salvation, reasonable in your sanctification, reasonable in your service for Him, reasonable in your study of this book, and reasonable, reasonable in your security on this earth. I'd like you to stand with your heads bowed. Your heads bowed, your eyes closed. In just a moment, I'm going to have a word of prayer. I'm going to ask the instrumentalists to come. In just a moment, I'll have a word of prayer when I get done praying. Then after that, the instruments will play. The invitation will be open. You say, well, preacher, I don't want an invitation. I want to get out of here and eat. Then leave. Then leave. But maybe somebody needs to do some business with God. Maybe somebody here this morning needs to trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you have never done that, let me tell you something. Church is a terrible place to go to hell from. Can you imagine sitting in a service like this one, stand through an invitation when you could have trusted Christ, and then walk out this door today and be in hell by sundown? It's happened more than once. If you're here and you haven't trusted Christ, you need to be reasonable about your salvation. Maybe I'm talking to somebody with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Is there anybody could be this honest? You'd say this, preacher, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'm saved. I know that I'm white from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, but I got a red spot. I know I got a little red spot. I need to be reasonable about getting that red spot sanctified and cleaned up. Here's my hand to acknowledge that. Come on, come on, be honest. All right, all right, thank you. What about your service for him? What are you doing for him? You know what we all think? We all think he ought to serve us. We think God exists to see to it that we have a great life. The exact opposite is true. We have life to see to it that he has a great existence. Maybe somebody needs to get serious today about serving this God that died for your sins, that gave you a brand new life, and loves you knowing what you are. Maybe this morning somebody needs to say, Lord, I'm going to serve you. Maybe somebody needs to be ashamed, finally, of their Bible ignorance, their willful Bible ignorance. Let me tell you what your pastor is not. He is your preacher, and he is your pastor, and he is your counselor, and he is your friend, and he is your teacher, and he is your spiritual guide. He may be many things, but you know what he's not? He's not the church hitman. It is not for him to be the only one in here that knows about how to deal with Mormons, and how to deal with JWs, and how to deal with the, the, the lost world. Everybody in here, you ought to be able to take care of them when they knock on your door. You ought to be reasonable in your study of this book. Maybe somebody needs to get reasonable about your security on this earth. I'm going to have a word of prayer. Maybe you just need to come up here, kneel, talk to the Lord for a little bit before we leave. Take care of business with God. 
Lord God, I thank you for your goodness and your grace. Now say it again, God, as we come to you this morning, we have no problem with you because there is nothing wrong with you. We have no problem with your Bible because there is nothing wrong with your Bible. Now, Lord, you saw the hands that went up, and I'm not, I'm not trying to put pressure on these people, God. You know the folks that have been saved and they got a little red spot. And it's not wrong, God, for them to be, it's not unreasonable for them to come into church like that. But it sure is unreasonable for them to leave church like that. So maybe somebody needs to get reasonable, just take care of business with you before they leave. Maybe somebody here needs to trust you as their personal Savior. Somebody needs to serve you. Somebody needs to study this book like they study all the things that they love. And somebody needs to be secure here and now, not just in eternity. So God, I pray that these people would be reasonable today as they have often demanded the preachers be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. With your heads bowed tonight.